all the ministry of helps here. You've been so wonderful and kind and gracious, and it's uh, just been a wonderful experience. And uh, you can't always say that when you go to churches, but it's been a wonderful experience here, and we appreciate your graciousness. So I'm going to turn to my Bible today to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. And uh, we're going to talk to you today on the subject of faith made simple. Faith made simple. And those of you that were here last night know I read from the King James. I mean, especially since it was good enough for Paul. It's good enough for me, right? We had a joke last night. Have you ever done, have you got, there are some churches you have to use the King James. All my memory work and all my study uh, uh, books and things are in King James, so I, I stick with it, but... There are people that, you know, believe that's all you can do. They don't understand the history of the Bible and that there were translations before the King James and after the King James, and there's still new ones today. And I was in, when I was in college, we had a discussion, and there was a, a man that went to a church that believed you had to read to King James or you weren't saved. And he told me, we had a discussion, and, and the only thing, the only, because I, I told him about the history of the Bible and how it had been translated, and the only thing he could come up with, he says, well, if it was good enough for the Apostle Paul, it's good enough for me. So those of you who know a little about the history, know Apostle Paul didn't have the King James, okay? He, he wrote it, all right, but he didn't have it in King James Version, okay? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. We're going to take the word substance here for a moment, and we're going to work with that word with you today. And uh, we want to talk about the fact that things have substance. The Bible says that faith has substance. Well, we know that things in the natural realm have substance, don't they? The chair you're sitting on has substance. The car you drove in here today has substance. This building has substance. This, we'll take this pulpit, for example. It has substance, lots of nice substance in there. Glad the one, I'm glad I'm not the one that has to move that baby. All right, but substance. And if something has substance, that one of the things it means, if it does have substance, is this. It means it's measurable. Would that be an accurate statement? If it has substance, it's measurable? For instance, uh, this pulpit, for example, is measurable. We can measure its length and width and depth. We can measure it, you know, by linear measurement. We could measure its weight, which is quite a bit. We could measure its volume, how much it would hold if it were empty. We can measure its mass, how dense it is. All types of different measurements we could take on this. Is that correct? Well, the Bible says that faith has substance. So wouldn't it be great if we had a way to measure faith and find out how much you had. How many of you would like to really know how much faith you really have? Would anybody like, okay. Well, ha half the congregation. This is the early service. We're trying to wake up, right? Did y'all have your coffee today? Do you serve coffee and donuts before this service? Maybe we should suggest that to the pastor. Just make sure everybody's got a good shot, a little sugar and caffeine here. Uh, anyway, if it has substance, if your faith had substance and we could measure it, wouldn't it be great? Well, just for the illustration of this sermon, to help you understand a couple of principles, I'm going to just pretend that I got with Brother Eric and we built a machine, uh, an electronic device full of computer plug-ins and wires and transistors and all types of things, and we built a device that we can measure faith with. And let's say it looks about like this pulpit, but it's a box, okay? It's a solid box, and it's got all the electronics inside. And on the front of it, I had Eric put a, a meter, one of those LED meters, you know, that jumps up and down. And that meter runs from 1 to 10, 1 to 10, 1 being low and 10 being high. And we attached a wire to it and put a little scanner on it like they have down at the grocery store or Walmart so that when we, you know, scan something, it comes up with a, with a reading there. Everybody following me so far? Just pretending here, okay? But just an illustration to help you understand. So I, I, I can, what I can do is that we, we can have you come and stand in front of the machine and we can scan you and see how much faith you have. So on a level from 1 to 10, right? So we scan Brother Rob. He's got a level 7. We scan Alice here. She's at level 6. And we scan somebody over here and they've got a level 3 and somebody over here and they're at 4. Making sense so far? Well, it would be great if we could do that, wouldn't it? Huh? Wouldn't that be great? Okay, can't do that, but it'd be great if we could. But if you can get the picture in your mind that faith has substance, that means it is measurable. You see, the Bible talks about weak faith. It talks about strong faith. It talks about ever-exceeding faith. It talks about growing faith. It talks about increasing. It talks about different types and levels of faith. Jesus was always telling the disciples how weak their faith was. 
So there are different levels, strengths, if you will, of faith, all right? Now turn with me to Mark eleven twenty three, 23, and we'll carry this, this thought one step further. Mark eleven twenty three. words in red, so that means Jesus is speaking. Jesus said, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. In this verse we find out about mountains. Everybody ever had a mountain in your life? Now, we're not talking about literal mountains here. Jesus is using uh, mountains as an illustration to talk to us about the obstacles, the problems, and the challenges that we face in life, isn't he? And I threw this thought out last night. I think it would be apropos here that uh, Jesus said the mountains can be removed, didn't he? In fact, he indicates to us we're supposed to move mountains. And I just want to throw this little thought out to some of you that still have, uh, uh, you know, just to help you with your doctrine a little bit, okay? If Jesus told us we could move mountains, then that has to mean that the mountains were not placed there by God. Because if the mountains were placed there by God, they would not be subject to removal. Hello? Does that make sense to anybody? If they were placed there by God, it would be his will and you couldn't move them. But since Jesus said you're supposed to move them, that means they weren't placed there by God. So you need to start looking that way and understand that the obstacles and challenges and things that you're facing in life weren't placed there by God. They're just mountains. Mountains just show up. Have you noticed that? All you can just leave the parking lot and mountains show up out here, amen? We live in Branson. We live in an area similar to yours, okay? One of the things about mountains is they're definitely measurable, aren't they? We have different sizes of mountains. Here we live in the Ozarks. They're... I, I call them bumps, but they're really, they call them mountains. The scientists call them mountains, so I call them mountains. Then you go out a little east of here, and you have the Smoky Mountains. You go out west of here, you have the beautiful Rockies. You have the Poconos, you have the Sierras. We have all types of mountains, don't we? Even just in the United States, we have, what, six, eight, ten different mountain ranges? And they're all different sizes and different levels, aren't they? So uh, that kind of really illustrates things in our life, doesn't it? You have some challenges that are small. You have some challenges that are big. You have some problems that don't seem of in, uh, almost no consequence. And then you have some that are so huge they look like the Rockies standing looking at you in the face, right? So mountains. But here in this verse, Jesus developed a correlation for us between faith and mountains. He said, Verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain... Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Shall believe. If you have faith, then faith moves mountains. Is that right? Mountain moving faith. We've heard that phrase throughout the years. Am I right? Does that make sense to anybody here? We, oh, are you following me? Six people in the front, two people in the second row, the ones in the back are still trying to wake up. Is that what it is? No, I'm sorry, just kidding in the back. You're fine, you're beautiful back there. I just can't see you because the lights are bright. Maybe it just looks like you're asleep because I can't see. Is that what it is? No, just kidding. It's okay we have fun here today. I hear your pastor on the radio. He has fun in church, huh? He tells jokes and stories, right? You laugh around. I knew, I knew when he invited me that I could get a laugh here. <laughs> right? <laughs> Communication. Newspaper photographer out of California trying to cover the fires raging in the forest. Calls his editor and says, uh, I, I can't get the pictures because they've got the roads blocked. I can't get through. The editor says, I'll call you back in a minute. Editor calls back in about five minutes and says, go to such and such a little local town. He says, we've got a private airplane waiting for you there with a pilot ready to go. You go there, get in the airplane, and he'll fly you over the fire and help you, let you take your pictures, and you can, you can get them back to us. Okay, great. So the guy jumps in his car, races to the little town, shows up at the little airport. Sure enough, there's an airplane sitting on the runway, revved up, motors running, pilots sitting in it. The guy grabs all his stuff, runs out to the airplane, jumps in the airplane, says, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. The airplane flies into the air. 
As they get up to their altitude, the, the, the photographer starts getting his stuff out of his bag, and he says, okay, here's what I need you to do. I need you to go over there to that fire, and I need you to fly real low, make three or four, four real low passes right over the fire. And the pilot looked at him and said, why would I want to do that? And the photographer said, because I'm a photographer. I'm a newspaper photographer, and I've got to take pictures of the fire. I've got to go right now. I've got to get my pictures in. I mean, I'm a photographer. That's what I do for a living. I take pictures. The pilot, in a very astonished look, turned to him and said, you mean you're not the instructor? Oh. <laughs> that one slowly sunk in from front to back, didn't it? All right. Communication is very important. Jesus said to communicate to the mountains. All right, mountains come in different sizes. <laughs> Got to loosen you up a little bit this morning. Mountains come in different sizes. So here's what I'm going to do. I talked to Eric, and we put in some more circuitry in our, in, our, in our faith measuring device, and we put in circuitry that could measure mountains. Isn't that great? So now what I can do, I can flip the switch from faith to mountain, and I can take my little scanner and I can go up to your life and you can tell me what mountain you've got in your life and I can scan it and I can see how big the, the mountain is. Wouldn't that be great? So I, I, Brother Rob, he comes to me and I scan his mountain and it's, it's level 7. Alice, her mountain's level 3. I scan somebody else and they're at level 4 and somebody's got a level 9, somebody's got a level 6, somebody's got a level 10 mountain. You follow me so far? I'm talking about the challenges and obstacles in life. Okay? Wouldn't that be great if we could do that? And then you would know exactly where your faith is compared to the mountain. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, we're going to talk to you in, in our tape set. We talk a lot about how to get your faith to the right level. But we want to make one point. Here's our first point this morning, okay? Here's our first point. If you've understood us so far, your faith has levels, your mountains has levels. And if we were able to gauge them or measure them on the same scale to compare your faith to the mountain, okay? Here's, the, here's a secret that you need to learn. When the level of your faith is equal to the level of your mountain, your mountain will move. I'm going to say that again because that's an important point. When the level of your faith equals or reaches the level of your mountain, your mountain will move. Is this the Presbyterian Church? Did I make the wrong turn this morning? It's quiet in here. It's okay. I used to be a Methodist minister. I can handle the quiet for a while. I was, but now I'm Pentecostal. So I like a little, little noise once in a while. See. All right. When the level of your faith equals the level of your mountain, your mountain will move. So, for example, let's say we went to Brother Rob and see we measured his faith and it said level 7, and the mountain we measured was level 7. Well, poof, it's gone. Done. Poof. He's, he can just pray, and it, it happens almost instantly. Okay? Uh, we measured, say, Alice, and her faith was at 6, and her mountain was at 3. Poof, it's just gone. But now, if we measured you, and you had level 3 faith, and you had a level 7 mountain, it's going to be a while before the mountain moves. Because now you have to get your faith up to that level 7 to get that mountain to move. Does that make sense to anybody? Now you can't wait. What you cannot do is you cannot wait until your faith is up to level 7 and then pray. You should go ahead and pray. That is the right thing to do. The right thing to do is go ahead and take what faith you have and apply it against the mountain and then work on your faith to get it built to the level of the mountain to get it moved. That is the right thing to do. At the same time, you have to realize and understand this fact that when you do that, there's going to be some time pass between the prayer and the moving of the mountain, isn't there? And that is where almost all Christians I've ever met get frustrated. I pastored for a number of years. I've been on the mission field. I, I, as an elder in the church and working in the ministry and church, I, I still get, you still get people who pray, they come to you and say, I know I prayed in faith. I know I believed God. I know that I released my faith, but nothing's happening. Ever been there, done that? Been there, done that, got the T-shirt, put the T-shirt in the garage sale. All right? 
Here's the thing, folks. When you pray and you go to the Father, according to Mark, we didn't read Mark 11, 24, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe you receive, and you shall have them. You go and pray and release that faith. And you know that you know that you know that you release the faith you had. But then so many people come to me and say, yeah, but I released my faith, but nothing happened. Well, see, if you have a level 7 mountain and level 3 faith, uh, it ain't going to move real quick. It's going to take a little bit, okay? Everybody follow me now. Now, if you've got, you know, you got level 7 faith and level 3 mountain, poof, man, this stuff's gone. I talked last night about there's always, there's always at least one in every church. I mean, everybody has their faith higher in different levels than others, right? We had a fellow in the church we went to in Wichita who had really high, high faith in the area of healing. I mean, he, he was just never sick, never. And, and, you know, he just, you know, and so what, it, it, well, here in this part of the country, we have sinuses and all that stuff, right? You know what I'm talking about? So, you know, you get the sinus thing and you'd be taking pills and you'd be doing nose spray and whatever you could do and you're walking around like this all week and just trying to make it through the week. And you show up at church and, hey, brother, how you doing? And, well, I'm doing okay. Kind of been fighting this sinus stuff this week, though. He'd look at you and go, I'll just rebuke it in the name of Jesus. It'll go away. You just want to reach up and slap a guy like that, don't you? I mean, here you're suffering all week, taking pills and all kinds of stuff, and, and here you just, I can get the name of Jesus, it'll leave. Oh, man. And, uh, am I right there, huh? It's real, real today, all right? A little real today, real reality check here, but it's true. So, but he had his faith built up in that area. So he was almost, I mean, almost never, never, ever sick. Never had colds, never had sinus problems, never had any of that, that stuff that, you know, a lot of people have. Just never had it. But his faith was high in that area. So you can have your faith real high in an area and, and just keep a lot of stuff off if it's high in that area. But what if, what if you've exercised your level three faith and you've got a level seven mountain you're facing? Well, now that's a different story. But what you have to understand is this. Because you don't see it, because it didn't happen when you wanted it to or the way you wanted it to doesn't mean First of all, it does not mean that you did not release faith. You released faith. You just didn't have enough built up inside you to move the mountain. The second thing you have to realize is this, that if you want to see that mountain move, you must build your faith to that mountain's level. You cannot sit around and wait because the mountain will sit there and stare you in the face if you do nothing. The third thing you have to understand is this, you got to get busy. You have to get to work and get your faith built up. I mentioned that bad, nasty word, work. Charismatics don't like the word work. They just want to come to church and praise Jesus. Hallelujah, and if something goes wrong, lay your hand on me, make it go away. Hello, are you with me now? Just make it go away. Come on, Brother Hartland, just pray and make it go away. I'll make you go away. <laughs> go go away and get in your Bible and get your faith built up. Amen. I can't move your mountains anyway. And besides that, if I moved it for you, it'd come back because you don't have the faith to keep it away. Am I right there? Is that helping anybody there now? Amen. So what you got to do is get busy and work, put out some effort, get in the Bible, get your faith built up, get you some tapes, get you some books, come to a good church like this where you got a good faith teaching pastor and get the word up inside you. Amen. See, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something right here that you have to understand. You can go to any other kind of church. I was a Methodist minister for many years. Brother Larry was a Baptist for many years. You can go to just about any other kind of church, folks. I'm, not, I'm not, not being negative here. I'm just making an analytical description for you, okay? You can go to just about any other kind of church and go to church and go to Sunday school and agree with their doctrine and you're good to go. That's it. Amen. Hello. That's all you have to do. Just go to church, go to Sunday school, agree with their doctrine, and you're done. You're a good member of that church. 
serve on the board, be a deacon, be a Sunday school teacher, whatever it is you need to do to serve God in that church, and you're finished. That's it. That's all there is to it. Amen. But I want to tell you something. If you want to walk in this faith stuff, folks, you've got to go back to school. You all will never be finished. You cannot just listen to me. I'm going to be as kind as about this as I can, but you cannot just show up at church a couple of times a week, say amen, agree with the doctrine, and have this stuff work in your life. It will not work for you. You will have to feed your faith more than just coming to church a couple of times a week and saying amen, that's right, preacher. If you want to be successful with this stuff, folks, you've got to get your Bible out every day. You've got to fellowship with God. You've got to get you some books and some tapes. You've got to listen to the radio broadcast. Somebody's preaching faith, somebody on TV, whatever you can get, however you need to get it, the best way for you. But you must be a studier. You must study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. That is the only way this stuff works, and I'm going to tell you why. Because the Bible says that we, having the same spirit of faith, and Jesus said, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. And you will never, ever accomplish and get into the spirit of faith that will move the mountains in your life until you get into the word of God and get enough of that in you because that is spirit word. And when you get enough of that spirit word in your spirit, at some point in time you will get into the spirit of faith and you will flow in the spirit of faith and it will bring revelation and understanding to your mind and help you walk out the things that you need to walk out and move the mountains in your life. Amen. Praise God. Sometimes it just happens, all right? <laughs> so let me encourage you. You cannot just come to a church like this, say amen, come to church a few times, work in the children's church and call it good and be successful at what we preach from this pulpit. You must be a student of the word. You must study. You must get word inside you and build faith. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. It comes, folks, it comes by the word. And my spiritual father, Buddy Harrison, always said, if it keeps coming, Someday it'll arrive. And when it arrives, it'll move your mountain. Amen? It has to keep coming every day, day after day after day. Amen? Hope that helps you a little bit. All right, praise God. It just happens that way, Brother Rob. It just, it just happens, all right? Praise God. Okay, well, now we were talking about mountains and faith and, and that kind of thing, right? Jesus has a very important thing to say to us. Uh, about the correlation between the mountains and the faith and what we need to be doing about it and how we need to, uh, one of the ways we need to be working this out in our lives and building our faith. In verse 23, and go back to that, it says, For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. And I, I've read it this way, others have read it this way, and it sounds good. For verily I say unto you, whosoever shall say, he shall have whatsoever he saith. All right? So this indicates to us that there is an important factor here, a missing link, if you will, called saying. Called saying your faith. Speaking the word. In our modern day word of faith movement, it's come to be known as confession. I don't care what you call it. You can call it affirmation. You can call it confession. I call it speaking the word. Whatever you call it, though, Jesus indicates to us it is a pivotal factor in you receiving the answers to your prayers and seeing the things you're believing for in life. Amen? All right. Praise God. To illustrate that, I'm going to, uh, a little illustration. Those of you who were here last night saw this, but we're going to do it again if that's all right. I don't know who's volunteering today. I don't need them yet, but I'll call for them here in a minute. Okay. I pastored in Texas for a time. Texans have strange ways of doing things. And in Texas, here's something I learned about. See this right here? In Texas, that's what they use on you if you go to sleep during church. I'm, I'm just kidding, okay? I, is that all right? I thought you just you'd have a little fun. That was just a little brother Larry came on me, I think, there on that one, all right? We're going to have a little illustration for you here. And what we're going to do is talk to you about speaking faith. We're going to go to the second point today about speaking faith. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to use this rope to illustrate for you. Uh, and this rope re represents my faith. So here's what's happened. I've gone down to the uh, doctor. And because of the kind of job, I'm making this up, of course, but we'll just say we went down to the doctor, and the doctor said uh, because of the kind of job I have on the feet, et cetera, et cetera, that I need a, a nice, good reclining chair where I can go home at night and, and soothe my back and get my feet up and kind of help my circulation. Would that be all right with everybody if you had a nice recliner? I, I encourage everybody to have a nice recliner. I use a recliner every day for my devotions. It's awesome. All right. So what I've done is I've gone down to the store, uh, the furniture store or whatever, and I've picked out this nice, beautiful green recliner. Now, you have to use your imagination here, okay? We're going to test your eyes of faith here, all right? This is, we're pretending that this is a nice, comfortable recliner. And I went to the store, and I tested it out, and I tested several, and this is the one I came up with that I thought I really wanted, all right? Now, the problem is I don't have the money for the recliner. So what I've decided to do is I've decided to exercise my faith and believe God for that recliner, okay? Is that all right? I'm going to use that for an illustration today. And so I'm going to re release faith and believe God for the recliner. So now if I'd have been a really good Texan, I could stand over here and lasso that chair, but I can't, so you've got to pretend with me, okay? So I'm going to pray here. So I come before the Father in the name of Jesus, and Father, uh, the doctor said I needed this chair, and I went down to the, the store, and I picked out that recliner. You know which one it is. It costs $250. And Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm asking you, according to Mark 11:24, I'm asking you what things soever I desire, and I pray, I believe I receive. I'm asking you in the name of Jesus for that green recliner that I saw at the store for $250, and I thank Thank you for it in Jesus name so what I just did there I prayed the prayer of faith and I released my faith and I threw it out there and I got a hold of my chair by faith in the spirit realm okay everybody is this all right with everybody we okay everybody follow me so far okay so this this rope represents my faith and uh, I've, I've done it by faith and by in the spirit by faith I have the chair now as we mentioned earlier, a lot of times what happens is when people pray, they release their faith, and uh, their faith level is actually lower than the mountain level, and they get frustrated about uh, receiving and about when things happen. And so what I've done is I have a level three faith, let's say, but that chair is a level five mountain. And so now I've got to get my faith level moved up to the level five mountain in order for me to uh, receive the chair. And so, of course, I'm going to study the Bible. I'm going to get tapes. I'm going to come to church. I'm going to keep my faith built up. I'm going to get some scriptures out uh, that promise me, you know, blessings, and I'm going to meditate on those. I'm going to do all those things. But one of the things that Jesus said we need to do here in Mark 11:23 is talk, say our faith. Amen? So here's the thing. Uh, Basically, in the body of Christ, I see three general responses to this type of situation. Here we have a person who has released their faith, level three faith, uh, level seven mountain. Is that what I said I was? Three and seven, okay. But the chair didn't come in in a week. And so the person gets frustrated and wonders why their faith isn't working. Most people will do this. They will say, well, I guess this just doesn't work. This faith stuff just doesn't work. And they'll just completely let go of their faith. It's gone. They've, they've just given up. And I submit to you that if in the spirit realm we could look at people's lives, there are, even ourselves, all of us probably have a faith project where we let go of the rope. There are some people, because they never accomplish and, and move up in this, in this understanding of faith, that probably if you could look at them, they have ropes laying all around their feet where they've just given up because they thought it didn't work. All right? That's one response. A second response uh, that I find a lot, uh, a lot in all denominations is this one. Because for some reason we weren't taught to believe God, we were taught to beg God or to try to convince God or to try to, to, it's called crying out to God. I call it the whine and cry method because it goes something like this. See if this sounds familiar. Oh, God, oh, God, you know I need this chair. Oh, I prayed and believed you for it. Oh, God, have mercy on me. You know the doctor said I need this chair and I'm supposed to have the chair. Oh, God, won't you please have mercy on me and help me get the chair. Oh, God, God, oh, Jesus, Jesus, please help me. Hope it doesn't sound too familiar. I call that the wine and cry method. Now, see, here's the thing. You spent some time with God, didn't you? I mean, you were in his presence. And you certainly cried 
In other words, you yelled out to God some things. And you certainly exerted some effort. But can I tell you something? You didn't release any faith. You just spent some time with God and, and did some crying and whining. And, and uh, even though you exerted effort and spent time in his presence, you're still at this end of the rope. You didn't make any progress at all toward that chair. Is this the Baptist church this morning? It got quiet. Okay. Walk on Water Faith Church. It says it somewhere, I think. Okay. Right place. All right. So according to Mark eleven twenty three. Here would be the third and a proper response. Jesus said you can have what you say. So I've released faith. I've claimed the promises of God. This is not some kind of wild, exotic luxury. This is something I really need. The doctor even recommended it. So this is something I have a genuine reason to believe for. But according to Mark eleven twenty three, 23, Jesus said to do something like this. Father, in the name of Jesus, the other day I prayed for that chair. I'm believing you for that chair. I just believe I receive that chair. I call that chair mine. I claim it, and I just thank you for it today in the name of Jesus. Now, when you do that, what you're doing is you're taking your hand, holding on to the rope, but ever heard the scripture, walk by faith, not by sight? See, I could pull the chair to me, but for this illustration, I'm going to use walk by faith, not by sight. I did that. I grabbed the rope, and I took a step of faith toward my chair. See, I can't see the chair yet. I can't feel the chair yet. Uh, but I took a step of faith when I said what I believed according to Mark eleven twenty three, 23. And there's a number of other scriptures that support that. Does this make sense to anybody? So, you know, the next day the chair doesn't show up. So I have three choices. I can what? Let go of the rope. I can go to the wine and cry method, oh God. Or I can do what Mark eleven twenty three 23 says and I can say my faith, Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I claim that chair. I think of that chair. I believe it's mine. I believe I receive it now. And I'm thinking of that chair. I call that chair by faith in Jesus' mighty name. Just making sense to anybody. I'm walking by faith. I'm holding on to the rope of faith with my mouth. In this illustration, I'm using my hands. But if, if it really happened this way in the spirit, when you say it, that's what would be happening. Okay, who's the volunteers this morning? Same ones? Oh, I'll oh, get the same ones. They know what to do then. We have these fine gentlemen here that are going to volunteer. You all remember your spots and what to do now. Uh, there's one thing about this faith stuff that sometimes, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, take it, there we go. I, there's, there's one thing about this faith stuff that sometimes people don't understand, and that's this, that when you start doing real faith stuff, there's this guy out there called the devil, and he doesn't like it, and he's going to come and check out and see. <laughs> just pretend, okay? These guys are just here for illustration. We are not typecasting here this morning, all right? But the devil is going to come and see if you really believe what you're saying, amen? So it works something like this. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just believe I receive my chair. Thank you so much for that chair. I'm calling that chair mine. I give praise to God. That chair is mine. I believe I receive that chair. In the name of Jesus, I believe for my chair. 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 What happened here? This is going so good. You can't afford that chair. Something's telling me I can't afford that chair. Something's telling me I don't, I don't have the money for that chair. This is it. Oh, no. Something just told me I don't have the faith for that chair. Oh, my gosh. All right. Right here, I have three choices. Do you know what they are yet? What's the first one? Let go of the rope. Just give up. The second choice is, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. What's the third one? Speak my faith, amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I don't care what the devil says. I don't care what the circumstances look like. In the name of Jesus, I believe I receive my chair in Jesus' name. Praise God. Whoo, Shimanda. I'm feeling good now. David said I can run through a troop and leap over a wall, baby. I'm running with David. When you pass an obstacle of your faith, when you do it correctly, folks, your faith just seems to shoot high as the mountain and you're just ready to roll. You know that nothing can stop you now. Amen? Amen? So here we go. Father, in the name of Jesus, I believe I received that chair. Oh, I call that chair mine. Oh, praise God, this chair, this is easy, easy, easy. Can you hear me now? You can't afford it. 
Oh, man, something's telling me I can't afford this chair. It doesn't belong to you. That chair doesn't belong to me, really. It really doesn't. I mean, it's down at the store. It's not like anybody's giving it to me or anything. I mean, I'm going to give it to the Joneses. They can afford it. You know, the Joneses can afford anything. They're probably going to buy my chair. The Joneses probably bought my chair, didn't they? They're waiting right now to get it. They're, just, they're at the loading dock right now waiting for them to load on their truck, aren't they? My chair is good. Bunched a wire again. There we go. Uh, 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 oh. What's my three choices? Do you know yet? Number one, let go of the rope. Forgive it and give it up. Number two, oh, God. Oh. What's number three? Father, in the name of Jesus, I just speak my faith. I believe I receive this chair in the name of Jesus. Whoo, she, ha, ha, na, ha, ha. Now I got past two obstacles. I'm really flying now. I think I'm just going to add a Cadillac onto this baby, you know. <laughs> Nothing to this, man. This is all right. This faith stuff really works, you know. <laughs> Father, in the name of Jesus. Here we go. In the name of Jesus. Oh, Father, I thank you for that chair. Oh, uh, uh, chair? If I told you once, I told you a hundred times you can't afford this chair. You know, I've heard it a hundred times. I bet I can't afford this chair. Maybe I should listen to that voice I'm hearing, huh? Something tells me God's not going to answer my prayer. Don't you remember that stuff no, you did last late. week? The stuff I did last week? Oh, no. I, oh, no. God can't answer my prayer because of the stuff I did last week. Isn't this terrible? All right, here's, here's the point. Just before you get to where you're going, this type of stuff doubles up. It's worse than it's ever been before. But one of the things you can know that is if it's this tough, you're almost there. Amen. What's my three choices? Number one... Give up, drop the rope. Number two, why oh, the cry? What's number three? Father, in the name of Jesus, I just think, I don't care what the devil says, I thank you for that chair in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. Give these guys a hand for helping me, will you? And if you'll be faithful to that, now here's an illustration of what might happen. I don't know how the chair is going to come to you. Maybe the Joneses bought it and didn't like it and decided to sow a seed and gave it to you. Maybe somebody came up at church and handed you a check. Maybe you got a bonus at work. Maybe the insurance company gave you a refund you weren't expecting. Don't know how, okay? We don't understand how. We don't have to explain that. All we have to do is do the believing. But I got my chair. I got my chair. Somebody gave me the money, and I went and got my chair, and I took it home, and I'm up relaxing, chicken out the channels. and took a cool drink. Amen? Does this make sense to anybody? All right, now, here's the thing. I got the chair in the natural. So now I don't have to use my faith on the chair anymore, do I? Is that correct? I can, use, I can take the faith away from the chair, but now I've got my faith that I can use on something else. And the beauty of it is that everything I learned about using it on this chair, now I can take it and apply it to other things. Amen. Does that make sense to anybody this morning? Okay. Well, if you understood that, if you understood that, folks, that will relieve a lot of frustration in your life. And, of course, that key ingredient is speaking, saying, and keep building your faith. Now, the question you always want to, people always ask, I don't have a machine that can measure your faith. I don't have a device that can compare your mountain to your faith. Is there a way? We, we gave one idea there, but is there a way that I can know in my heart that I have built my faith up to the level of my mountain and my mountain's ready to move? Is there a way? I'm going to tell you at least three ways from the Bible. Would that be all right today? It's a, three ways you can know that your faith is at the level of your mountain and the mountain's ready to move. Romans 15, 13. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Romans 15, verse 13. First part of the verse says this. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing in believing joy and peace one of the first indicators that you get when your faith level gets up to the level of your mountain is peace the peace of God that passes all understanding have you ever experienced that you know the uh, scientific world and the dictionary defines peace as like as the absence of malice or the absence of distress or the absence of things however the peace of God is a manifestation of his presence if you look in Galatians chapter 5 22 and 23 where it describes the fruit of the spirit you'll find peace is listed there 
So that tells us that peace, the peace of God that comes from God is a function of the spirit realm and is a function, can be a function in your spirit down inside. So one of the things that happens is you just get this peace. Perfect peace. The perfect peace that passes. All understand. You just peace. People ask you about your chair. Oh, praise God, I got the chair. Well, it doesn't look like I have the chair. I know, but I got the chair. Well, how do you know you got the chair? I just know I got the chair. I think it was Oral Roberts that coined the phrase, you know that you know that you know that you know. And it developed the, the peace. A peace fills your heart. And you're just in peace. And it doesn't bother you. And it doesn't, those, those things that the devil's saying that you can't afford it and you don't deserve it and all that, eh, they just roll off you like water off a duck's back. Boom, they're gone. Peace. Mm. Another item listed there in, in that verse is joy. Folks, have you ever told one of your little children or have ever seen a child when they come and ask you and you tell them, yeah, we're going to go to the store later or to, to the Andy's, you got an Andy's custard here I see now. Just opened a few weeks ago. You, get, you, you tell your child you're going to go to the lake, whatever you tell them, and they get so excited. And that's all you can hear for the next two or three days is daddy's taking me to the lake or mommy's taking me to the store or whatever it is or there's a birthday or whatever, whatever it is. You know what I'm saying? Anybody with me there? You know how excited they get? They are already experiencing the joy of the event that hasn't happened yet. Why? Because they have faith in what you said. When your faith level is equal to the level of your mountain, your joy will come on you for that thing. You'll be so excited. You'll be just as happy as if you already had it. You'll just be as happy as if you already possessed it. Whether it's healing or money or cars or clothes or your kids getting saved or whatever it is. You'll be so happy and excited. You'll have a big smile on your face. And if somebody asks you about it, say, yeah, praise God, I got my chair. You do. When did they deliver it? They haven't delivered it yet, but I got it, praise God. Well, when are they going to deliver it? I don't know, but I got it, praise God. I'm so happy about my new chair. It's a supernatural thing. It doesn't make sense to the head, but that joy rises up and you get so excited you can hardly stand it. You just want to tell, you want, you, you're, if you're smart, you won't tell everybody about it because everybody doesn't understand this stuff, but you want to tell everybody about it. Amen? Peace and joy. Number two. Number two. We find a second indicator in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3. I'm endeavoring to do my best to get you to the restaurant before the Baptists. <laughs> Too late. They're already. Oh, <laughs> well, their early service started at 8:30, though. See, they, they cheat. <laughs> uh, I had this lady in one of my Methodist churches. You know, Methodists have to get out at noon too. You know, and if I went just a little past noon, she'd get up and leave. And I pastored in this little town, and we only had two places to eat, and one was like the Dariette type thing, you know. Well, it was down at the other end of town by the Baptist church, and the only good, nice, sit-down restaurant with good food was down on our end of town by our church. And I, I, after this happened a few times, I asked this lady, I said, you know, why do you get up and leave at noon? I mean, I finish by 5 or 10 after if I run a little late, but why do you leave at noon? She said, because I, if I don't leave exactly at noon, the Baptists will get all the good seats at the restaurant. So I'm doing my best here. All right. Number two, Hebrews 4, 3. Uh, the first part of the verse says, for we which have believed do enter into rest. When your faith levels reach the level of your mountain, there's a rest that comes. Sometimes when you uh, see especially especially when your faith level is lower than your mountain level and you first pray, a lot of times there's a lot of turmoil and distress in your mind. A lot of times you're troubled about it. A lot of times you're anxious about it. And a lot of times when the devil comes and hits you with that stuff like you can't afford it or you don't deserve it or whatever, all that stuff that we heard today and more, a lot of times you get all upset and anxious and, oh, 
and trying to deal with that and trying to decide if that's right or not and trying to determine whether you're, that's, you know, you're really in faith or not. When your faith level gets to that mountain level, all that goes away. Just a nice, wonderful, calm rest comes into your mind and your life. And it's almost like this. It's almost that you get to the point that you don't even care if you get it or not because you're enjoying the experience so much. But you know you're going to because you, you've got it already by faith. Amen? Does that make sense to anybody? And then the last point is this. In closing, folks, very last night I heard my in closing story. I'm not going to tell that today. I'll, I'll tell you the, little, the short one, though. Little pastor's son came up to him one day and tugged at his jacket and said, Daddy, Daddy. He said, What is it, son? He says, Daddy, how come you preachers are always saying in closing? He says, Son, that's so the people will have hope. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. I know that your pastor, I've heard him on the radio, I know he's a good word of faith teacher, I know that one of the things he's taught you is that when you pray in faith, one of the things you immediately do is begin thanking God for the answer in advance. That is an act of faith. I think it was Norval Hayes that said that faith is giving thanks to God for something you can't see. So you go ahead and give thanks. You pray, you release whatever faith you have, whatever level you're at, toward whatever mountain level it is, and then you go ahead and give thanks until you see the physical results. And that's what this verse is telling us. Make your supplication with thanksgiving. It should accompany each other. And here's one of the final indicators to tell you when your faith level's up to the level of your mountain. And I'll tell you a little story about it to illustrate it. Several years ago, and it's, we do this over and over, but this particular time probably was, the, I guess, the first time we needed a car. And I started believing God for a car, and I prayed and believed I received a car, and every night I'd go to God and praise and worship God for, for the car. A car, thank you, Lord, for my car. Thank you for that car. We just give you praise and glory and honor. Thank you for a car. Thank you for a car. Oh, praise and bless you. Thank you. I was going through the same turmoil you do sometimes. I was going through the same because I was early in the stages of it. My faith level was low, and I was working on getting my faith up to the level of the car. One day as I was giving thanks to God for my car, just thank you, Father, for my car. Thank you for the car. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that car. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. I thank you for my car. Down in here in my spirit, down in here. You know what your spirit is? Everybody know you're a spirit, soul, and body, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. If you go to this church, I know you know that. You're three parts. You have a spirit, you have a soul, you live in a body, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Down here in my spirit, something changed. There was a change in the way it felt down here. Instead of this kind of faith pushing against the mountain, this great joy and peace came inside, the, the, what, what I just talked about. I noticed a change, and I thought, well, that's neat. This is great. So every day I go, thank you, Lord, for the car. Thank, and every day after that, that same wonderful feeling would come inside. Somebody gave us a car, a nice car. And I'm riding around in the car and thanking God for the car. The second day after we got the car, I'm driving the car thanking God for the car. Because, I mean, somebody gave us the car. Because at the time, that was the only way we could get a car was believe God to have somebody give us a car. At least that's the only way I thought. So I was just believing for a car. I didn't care how it came, but I sure was glad it came. Amen? But the thing I noticed was this. The day after I got the car, when I was giving thanks to God for the car, I noticed that that was the same feeling that started two weeks before. And I want to say it to you this way. When the level of your faith has reached the level of your mountain and you're giving thanks for the thing you're believing for, it will feel the same way inside that it does the day after you get the thing in the natural. Does that make sense to anybody? When your faith level has reached the level of the mountain and the mountain is just getting ready to move, it will feel the same way inside when you give thanks for it that it will 
the day after you get it. Does that make sense to anybody? So let us encourage you today. Build your faith. Get to work. Get to believe in God. Exercise faith. Speak the word. Say what you believe. Talk it. Say it. Keep it going. Hold on to the rope for all you're worth. Because if you'll just hold on with your words, nothing can make you let go. Amen? We encourage everybody always to do everything they can for God, to be everything they can be in God, and to believe God for all of His blessings. Just before we finish, I'm going to pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Uh, I guess I turn over Rob. I don't mean we'll be. I'm not an authority to dismiss anybody, but just, just very quickly, I want to tell you this. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that He left His home in glory, that He came to the earth, walked here as a man, and demonstrated for us what the true love of God is. The Bible tells us that He went to a cruel cross, that He was crucified. That means He was killed on our behalf. He didn't do it for him, he did it for you and me. He was what the Bible calls our substitute in our place. And the Bible tells us that God raised him from the dead from the third day. The Bible also tells us that he's seated on the right hand of God. The Bible tells us in John 1, 14, as many as receive him to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And the Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you'll believe that, that God raised him from the dead, and that if you'll confess by faith Jesus as your Lord, you too will be saved. You'll be born again. God will take the blood of Jesus, wash away all your sins. He will give you eternal life and impart it into your spirit. And you'll be a child of God and be able to fellowship and live with him forever and ever in heaven. Amen? In light of the sermon we just preached, I want to tell you this. Most mountains define their own size. However... There are certain mountains that God defines the size of. And in the case of what we're talking about, receiving Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, in the case of being born again, being saved, what we call being saved, God has defined the size of the mountain as a level one. He has also defined that if you will believe that God raised him from the dead and confess that Jesus is your Lord, that's a level one faith, and you will receive instantly. Does that make sense to anybody? So before, as I, to finish my part of this this morning, before I turn to Brother Rob or whoever we're turning to, I'm going to pray a prayer. And I'm going to ask you right now to bow your heads, close your eyes. I'm going to ask everybody to repeat this prayer after me. And if you're here today, if you're listening to a tape or a video in the sound of my voice and you have never made Jesus Christ your Savior and your Lord, you repeat this prayer with us today. The words are not as important as your, the meaning of your heart. I want you to say this today as earnestly as you can. And when you're finished, the new life of Christ will come and you will be what the Bible calls a new creature and you'll be born again. Say this with me. Say, Dear God, I understand that I'm in need of a Savior. I believe that you raised Jesus from the dead on the third day. Lord Jesus, I ask you to come in my heart to live there forever to take your blood and wash away my sins. And I say this, by faith, I receive Jesus as my Savior. I confess him as my Lord. And now I say, I'm born again. I'm a child of God. I'm saved. My sins are washed away. I'm on my way to heaven. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today for the very first time, you've never received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, please see Brother Rob, myself, one of the elders or deacons, someone here in the church. We want to pray with you and talk with you and make sure you get started out on the right step in your new life in Christ. Amen. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for letting me come and minister to you. Appreciate it. Brother, whoever's coming, praise God. Thank you, Harlan. Thank you. Did anybody learn anything today? Amen. All right. Well, what the Word says in Galatians 6.6, 6, if you learn something, it says, let him who is taught the Word share in all good things with him who teaches. So the Word right there says that if you learn something today, we're going to give a love offering.
for Heartland right now, which will all go to Heartland Oats, please. Ushers, if you'll pass the buckets. When you're through, you're dismissed and